Now, statistical populations that we've seen a young one, a medium one, and an old one would suggest that if we continue to see that trend with interstellar objects, future ones that are detected, which is what the LSST, that's one of the beautiful things about that is that it, it will detect more of these along with the other telescopes. It, that that will tell you if you keep seeing that trend of relatively equal amounts and you need a lot more for this of course i'm well aware of that but if it if you see that trend where it's it's all three of them are about equal in numbers in population then what does that tell you in other words what can you tell from seeing that that variance in in the population of interstellar objects what does that tell you about mass and things like that and i think more importantly is in the case of 3 Atlas, shouldn't that be the rarest type coming from an earlier period in the universe? Yeah, no, you're totally right, John. That's a, I think it's funny to even be talking about that with you now because I feel like in the last several years, like I was hoping so badly to find more of these objects and we were not finding them that I didn't let myself think about what the repercussions or interpretations would be if we found them, that now I get to speculate on that just that in itself is kind of exciting because it's what I've been wanting to do for a while, but I've been scared to let myself. But now that we found the old one, I think, yeah, it's fair to say, you know, if we find more and we see this trend where we see, you know, just ballpark, you see a third of them are, yeah, you see a third of them are really old, a third of them are really young and a third of them in the middle. I think that's telling you that planet formation. Yeah. I think it's, it's tell. I mean, We could go on and on about caveats, but, you know, there's the caveats of like also, you know, these things could get destroyed during their travels through the interstellar medium. So older stuff might get selectively destroyed as well. But very, I'm not going to, I'm going to just speculate. So don't hold me, don't hold me accountable for what I say here. But it could be telling you that, you know, the, 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 the stars in the Milky Way at the youngest epochs of star formation in the Milky Way galaxy were efficiently forming planets. And remember, John, you had alluded to this earlier, but, you know, the younger times in the galaxy, there have less supernova have come off. I think every, all of your listeners are familiar with this, but I'll just expand a little. Just as supernovas go off, that as the galaxy ages, supernovas go off and they produce metals and those metals, those metals will then enrich the interstellar medium. And then as new stars form, planets that form in those disks, there's more metals to form planets out of them. So uh, metal, the youngest stuff in the galaxy is lower metallicity, very approximately. Again, there's some caveats there, but I think it's telling you potentially that the youngest stuff that's at lower metallicities was also efficiently forming planets. And it's like, we're not, we're not just talking about forming planets kind of generically, like we're talking about forming Planet formation, like violent and vigorous planet formation occurring to the extent where you have like a hugely massive thing like Jupiter and Neptune, which is able to move around and eject Earth masses worth of material of interstellar comets like Atlas and Oumuamua. Like we're talking about vigorous dynamical instabilities occurring at very young stages. So, yeah, I think there's a lot potentially to learn. You know what would be freaky? I'll speculate, too. So say that in the future, 150 years from now, we're able to go and do a sample return mission to an asteroid that's moving at this speed, dating it to that period in the universe. And we go and we look at it and we look at the iron levels and they're exactly the same as today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you understand what I'm getting yeah, at. I think that, I that, would be, that would be weird, really <laughs> strange. But but the, what would be interesting is to compare that because that would give you some data, I guess, on if you had enough of a sampling of these objects, you know, sample returns and looking at the iron, that would tell you a lot about supernova rates during the, the early universe. So there, there is a lot of reasons to study this stuff. Yeah, it's almost like like you're, I think you're getting it right. Like it's like an unprecedented window into star formation throughout the galaxy and supernova rates and everything. Supernova rates is a function of time, even something like that. If you had enough interstellar objects that you got up close observations of, or even, you know, in situ samples. And, and it pays to remember here that these three objects, these three detected interstellar objects so far represent three different other star systems. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, this is, you don't have to cross space time to go in and look at other star systems with a spacecraft or 
a light sail or whatever you're using, it's coming to you. You, you won't know exactly what star system, but you're going to get a profile of, of star systems in the Milky Way by studying interstellar objects. And that absolutely blows my mind because that is an alien rock. That's not from yeah. here. <laughs> you know, that forms somewhere else. <laughs> absolutely. And, and another thing is like, it's not like, it's a subtle point about you saying you don't know where it came from because it's true that you can't trace any one of them back to any given star, but you can say something about where they come from. Because you could say, if you detect a lot of them, you could say stuff like, oh, you know, these ones are probably older on average and these slow ones are probably younger on average. And you can say, oh, well, these kinematics look like they look like they were moving with this stellar association or something like that. So you can kind of, you could say more about the origin, at least the origin stellar population. You could say more about that than nothing. True. Now, let me ask you this. Comets create meteor showers basically the earth moves through the the former path of a comet and we see it as a meteor shower so they're leaving material behind would an interstellar object leave material behind that possibly could be collected in, in the future like this object in its wake as it goes past perihelion and heats up and it's throwing off dust could you go out there and perhaps collect some of that dust or would you not even be able to differentiate it from the normal dust of the solar system yeah, no, that's an excellent question, John. So the, the one you want to do that with was Oumuamua because Oumuamua got really close to the Earth. So they did that. So Quanzi Yi and Qicheng Zhang, they were looking into meteor radar data to see if they could detect any meteor showers from Oumuamua. Unfortunately, that all turned up non-detection. So that was just all we were able to get from those non-detections, which are still useful as uh, limits on the production of stuff that came off of it. But absolutely, that is something we could do. The issue with 3i Atlas, although it's vigorously outgassing and producing dust, much more so than a Muamua obviously was, it does not get as it gets nowhere near as close to the Earth as a Muamua did. So it is a, it is basically hopeless. It, it it is hopeless to get particles from that object on Earth that we could identify. It's just like it's not going to cross Earth. But that doesn't mean that it's not shooting out stuff into the space that if we had a spacecraft close to it or in its wake or something like that, you couldn't sample. Like, absolutely, you could sample a coma of a comet. Send in JAXA. They're experts at this. At yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you this. Volatiles and depletion. In other words, given that this object is is very, very ancient, but yet it's it's producing a coma, does that suggest that it was never close to its star? In other words, it was never a comet that, we, as we normally see them, you know, solar system comets on their orbit, but rather just some distant object that formed from the star way distantly, like in the Oort cloud or whatever, and got ejected that way, and that this is the first star that has come close. And if you ever saw a comet that performed very, very strongly or very, very weakly, would that imply that it had, at in its past, passed close to a star? Yeah, no, that's a really good question, John. So, yeah, presumably, to presumably, everything you said is correct in the correct interpretations. I think the nat the natural thing to think is the fact that this thing is sublimating pretty far out, like it has volatiles that haven't been depleted. It couldn't have spent too much time really close to a star. It's very unlikely, even for 3i Atlas, just because the, the galaxy is so, I don't know if porous is the right word, but the galaxy, there's so few star, stars are spaced out so far apart from each other. It is extremely unlikely that any interstellar comet would have had any, that we see passing through the solar system would have had any close encounter with any other star, like really close. So presumably any interstellar comet we ever find has almost certainly never been close to a star since it was ejected from its home system. If they still have volatiles, le like ices left in them, then yeah, I think it's safe to say that that object probably didn't spend too much time close to its host star if it formed in a protoplanetary disk before it got ejected. But one thing, I mean, sitting in the interstellar, I mean, we don't really know. We don't know what's going to happen to a comet if it, inter if it sits in the interstellar medium for like 10 giga years. Like, I think what exciting thing is, you know, how far back was this thing actually sublimating? Because Jenny Bergner and I, we I think we did an episode with you, but Jenny had this awesome theory about a muamua being radiolytically produced 
H2 in amorphous H2O ice, where you get basically, as you get a water rich ice that travels in the interstellar medium and gets zapped with cosmic rays and stuff, you get these radiolytic H2 products, so radiolytic things like hydrogen and oxygen trapped in the ice. And then as the ice comes through the solar system and heats up, you release that stuff. I mean, it's possible that you have something like that going on with 3i Atlas because it's way older. So it should have actually been exposed to a lot more high energy radiation. So I don't know. And I mean, I mean, you could also probably fine tune things in such a way that you did spend a significant amount of time close to a host star, but then this thing traveled through the galaxy for a while and then it shed some of its you know, like as it comes through the solar system, it lost some of the outer shell of the nucleus. And so you're revealing fresh ice from the interior. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of question marks, but um, we're just spitballing, speculating. But what you said is presumably could be accurate. It, it's going to be interesting to find out because these, these are the beginning questions. Yeah. You know, this is where you start, you know, you, and the one thing I wonder about is, all right, as an amateur astronomer, the one thing that I have not seen I've seen close, but not not the way that they're described historically. Is a great comet, you know, the great comet of whatever. Now, Hale Bopp was was very very obviously visible to the naked eye and photographable, and it, I guess it got sort of close within my my period, and that was the '90s. We haven't seen one like that since, but they're they're rare. But is it possible, since this is fresh material from other star systems, that under the right circumstances and passing close enough to Earth, you could have an interstellar great comet? I think um, as much as I would love that, John, because I guess I'm younger than you, but I didn't see Hale Bop. Like, I would love that. I don't think it, I think it's highly unlikely. Just because, like, I mean, just like a naked, just think about, like, just seeing a naked eye comet is a pretty rare event. And there are many, for every interstellar comet, there is a very large number of regular comets that we can see even with telescopes. So I think you have to, you'd have to be extraordinarily lucky for an interstellar naked eye comet to come through the solar system. But we have to be pretty, uh, we, I feel, I feel like we were lucky to spread that Atlas caught this guy. So, you know, you know, weirder things have happened. So maybe I'm not going to say no. It'd be interesting to go back and, you know, I don't know that we have any data on the movement of of the the great comets that we haven't traced, right? I mean, some mm -hmm. of them we we know exactly what comet it was, um, Halley's comet being a famous example. But the uh, which was spotted, uh, you know, in past in the tenth century, something like that. You know, long ago, people have seen that comet, and that led Edmund Halley to say that you know, well, this is periodic. But anyway. It would be interesting if you had enough data on those past comets to infer that that thing was moving really fast and was an interstellar object. But I don't, th I don't think that exists in the historic record, at least <laughs> maybe the last 300 years, but not, not before then when, you know, great comets, you know, were noted in the 1600s and all that. That's a great idea. Don. I would trust, I, mean, I would also trust someone like you to do a better job of digging that up than me because you're actually, I, 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 yeah. I, I will, I will attempt I to do that. That just occurred to me. So I can't report anything, <laughs> but I'll take a look at it. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting idea that, you know, because the interstellar objects have been cooking through the whole time. Yeah. And one thing that, that another thing that I, that I wonder about is we have a big meteorite collection on this planet. In, in the institutions and private collections and laying out in the desert and, you know, everywhere, bottom of the ocean, all of it, there's, there's many, many meteorites. Surely at some point, an interstellar one has actually hit. Now there's of course the claim that there was one, but I, I, I that doesn't look like a meteorite, but just looking at isotoper issues and things like that in the meteorite collections might yield something interesting at some point. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, um, I actually have a paper under review that should be coming out soon. I, I'm slowed down because of Atlas, so I did. I stopped working on the referee report because I was wrote and wrote this paper, but uh, I was looking into what the population of interstellar objects that hit the Earth should look like. So I am also just like you, pretty interested in that idea right now. But yeah, I I think it's um. I think we've talked about this before, John, but yeah, there certainly it's possible that there's something in the meteoritic record that was interstellar. I think that the difficulty is like we have no idea what it should look like chemically. So I think you'd be more likely to nail down something as interstellar from its orbit than the composition. But I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. 
it might be it is interesting and there is you know let me tell you there is weird stuff in the meteorite inventory there's one particular fall that isotopically came in as very very close to the earth but it can't be the moon the origin which led to a hypothesis and this is very very obscure stuff but it led to the hypothesis that that thing was blasted off of thea <laughs> i know what you're talking about yeah yeah, yeah. you know what i'm talking about yeah. it's like wow yeah yeah, yeah. yeah.